I want your badge, I want your weapon, I want your ass. Who in the fuck do you think you are? He thinks he's Rambo. Rambo is a pussy. Oh, it is an Armani with a badge. Hello, hello, I'm Katie and welcome to Retromade, your pop culture rewind. Let's continue the exploration of the best of the 80s and 90s. And in case you missed the premiere episode, be sure to go back and check out my discussion with Ryan about Big Trouble in Little China. Today, I'm continuing coverage of one of our ultimate everyman, Kurt Russell, with yet another of his cult classics. This time, we'll travel back to December 1989 for his buddy cop team up with the one and only Mr. Sylvester Stallone. Don't you worry, all you Swayze fans, he's on deck for next episode. And tonight, I am delighted to be joined by Sean Malloy, the man behind a podcast very near and dear to my heart, the I Must Break This Podcast. Clever, right? Sean and I are both in the Last of the Action Heroes podcast network. Sean for his wonderful Dolph Lundgren coverage, and me as the co-host of a Rocky Series podcast called One More Round. Sean, thank you so much for joining me on one of my first episodes of Retromade. Hey, just a quick note from Katie here. My guest Sean was having video difficulties, so his video is spotty, in case you're wondering why it's mostly me in this one. Thank you for the invite. And man, when you, when you, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for, broached the idea of this particular show and you gave me the list of uh, films, it, it was without a doubt, oh, Tango and Cash, most definitely. So thank you for this opportunity. This will This will be fun. Glad to hear it. So I think we'll start by opening the little time capsule from December 1989. According to Nielsen ratings, the popular TV shows in 1989, or specifically December, were The Cosby Show, Roseanne, Cheers, A Different World, The Golden Girls, one of my favorites, The Wonder Years, Empty Nest, Who's the Boss?, And a little-known show called The Simpsons premiered in 1989. Can you believe that The Simpsons premiered in 1989? And isn't it still on? It's still on. But you know what's so funny about it is I have yet to meet anyone who is still actively watching it. It's amazing to me that it's still running. It's still going. But it's that show that I think even the most loyal followers seem to have dropped off at about season 19. (laughs) Well, that's a pretty good good run. Okay, so since I'm a big fan of the Golden Girls, picture it, America, late 1980s, on Thursday evening, which shows are can't miss in your household when you were a kid in 1989? Oh, man. I can tell you, I distinctly remember when Golden Girls was on. I did not watch that one. My my grandparents did. But I do (laughs) remember it was Empty Nest was also on alongside Mm -hmm. it, right? Empty Nest. And uh, I'm trying to remember what I watched in 1989. I I mean, when Simpsons came on, that was a game changer. And I did watch experience, or excuse me, my TV viewing experiences are from the 90s, to be perfectly honest. Because I'm trying to think, in 1989, Mm -hmm. I was seven. So I don't have a heck of a lot of TV memories, which is weird. But 1990, that year, is burned in my brain because there was Simpsons, Mm -hmm. obviously. So the short-lived television show, The Flash, aired on CBS. I loved The Flash almost. That was Thursday nights. Um, And also, yeah, Wonder Years. I was a big fan of Wonder Years as well. So 1990 was a big... The 80s are a little tricky because it's more... For me, it's memories of watching whatever my parents were watching. And my grandparents, too. I do remember watching Golden Girls with my grandparents a lot. But I, you know, I can remember Who's the Boss, Empty Nest, Golden Girls, vaguely, and probably and The Wonder Years. They were more known to me, along with Cheers, later, maybe more when they were in syndication. Yeah. And when I say the 90s, it's interesting because... Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the shows from the 90s, but I want to say it was, I mean, I know we're going a little bit past 1989, but around that same time, I remember Monday nights, Evening Shade with Burt Reynolds. Well, Do you remember that? I've heard of it. I've not seen it, I don't think, yeah. but I know of it. Uh, Coach. Coach with yeah. Craig T. Nelson. Coach and um, the, the other one, which <laughs> it's funny because it, it, they played it on Netflix a couple years ago and I did watch an episode and it's kind of amazing to me that it lasted as many seasons as it did, but Major Dad. That was another one that was okay. Like one. That's not one I that. watched, but I can picture it yeah. sort of. Okay. Anyway, going yeah. down the rabbit hole. <laughs> the lineup um, in 1989 for the Saturday morning cartoons were a pup named Scooby Doo, Gummy Bears, Winnie the Pooh, 
Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show, Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters, Beetlejuice, Smurfs, Muppet Babies, which was one of my favorites, Pee Wee's Playhouse, California Raisins, Garfield and Friends, and Alvin and the Chipmunks. Do any of those sound familiar to you? Wow. Yeah, no, those take me back. Yeah, I mean, Saturday morning cartoons. Now, that's actually what I remember much more. It was a whole thing in the 80s. Yeah, it was a thing. And it's so sad that we don't Mm -hmm. have that anymore. Yeah, no, that was was that was prime time for kids. And I do. Of course, I remember Pee Wee's Playhouse. I remember that one. Oddly enough, if you want to go further down the timeline, I distinctly remember where I was when I found out that his show was being canceled and what Paul Rubens did that caused that. And I remember being about nine, ten years old and being like, what did he do? I, too, recall it being a major scandal, which is kind of hilarious. That wouldn't be a scandal at all now, just considering, um, you know, where we are today. It's we do have different perspectives Mm -hmm. on things. So it's Saturday morning in the mid to late 80s in your household. What were you most looking forward to watching and what bowl of cereal are you eating while you're watching it? Excellent, excellent question. Man, you're hitting the hard ones. Um, I'm trying to think. You didn't mention it, and I'd have to go back, but I remember The Real Ghostbusters was a classic. Beetlejuice was also one of my favorites. Although Beetlejuice was one of those movies. In fact, it's one of the ones that <clears throat> my, my kids love as well. You know, it's one of those ones that just never gets old. Mm-hmm. But what was always so frustrating is I remember, like, Beetlejuice wasn't friends with Lydia. You know what I mean? Like, why is he... <laughs> Why is he palling around with Lydia going on adventures? That You know what I mean? So that was one of my favorites. There was a version of Superman by Ruby Spears, who was an animator back in the day. He had a version of Superman that aired. But the problem is those episodes were so early in the morning that I was never able to wake up on time to catch those ones. So I didn't see those. Uh, regarding cereal, that's an easy one. It was either Cocoa Puffs or um, Cocoa... Pebbles, Ooh, the, the, the Flintstone, Flintstone version, yes. because what was great about those is you'd finish the bowl and then you'd have just a chocolate bowl of milk. chocolate milk to drink. Yep. So speaking of the Flintstones, yeah. well, not so. Yes, there are tons of cartoons that I didn't mention. I was only showcasing the ones that just so happened to be on the lineup in 1989, the year of the movie we're going to discuss. But there's mm-hmm. so many. I know Cocoa Pebbles reminds me of the Flintstones, which, while not an 80s cartoon, I do remember watching that a lot as a kid. I loved the Flintstones and Scooby-Doo and Muppet Babies. Mm -hmm. Transitioning more so maybe for older kids, but there was midday programming back in the day as well. I don't remember watching, but in 1989, the lineup included ALF, the animated series, Raggedy Ann and Andy. Also, I don't remember. Kissy Fur seems (laughs) like vaguely I can picture it. Do any of those sound familiar to you? No. In fact, it's always, it's always fun to kind of go down a rabbit hole and go on Wikipedia, just read about some of these television shows. These, especially for children's programming, in a lot of ways was kind of this lawless frontier in so many ways because you had movie properties that were not kids' movies suddenly getting Mm. cartoons. I mean, you mentioned Beetlejuice, but that's really not a kid's movie if you really think about it. We had Rambo. We had Robocop. These are all cartoon series that the source material is not for kids, but we were sold it as uh, as Saturday mornings. I mean, it's kind of wild. You mention a lot of these. And I remember seeing the ads for them, but I never watched them, obviously. But yeah, it's just kind of wild. There's some others that kind of aired around that time called Brave Star. Mm -hmm which is about a cowboy on another dimension or something. And it's just kind of wild. Like a lot of these cartoons, you wouldn't get them nowadays. No way would you get any of these shows. It's true. (laughs) You know, what's interesting is over the course of researching a little bit of this, and I didn't even realize that when I was a kid on cartoons and Saturday morning programming was all because of deregulation. They were all just commercials Mm -hmm. to sell us toys. And in the seventies, it was more regulated, but Here comes the 1980s, and it's just basically a big free-for-all. And all of the mascots for the cereals were all cartoons, so there was no line between a commercial and a show for us kids. But I think you might recognize a little show that started around this time called Saved by the Bell. Of course. That was... Yeah. That sort of epitomizes like the late 80s and early 90s for me. 
It's interesting you mentioned Saved by the Bell because I actually did watch a documentary. I highly recommend it. There's a wonderful series that's out called The Dark Side of Comedy, if you're familiar with it. But each episode profiles a comedian and the, I don't want to say the dark life they led, but their rise and fall, if you will. And one of the episodes is on Dustin Diamond. And his episode is absolutely fascinating because it shows how it was his career that essentially, in a lot of ways, maybe it didn't kill him, but it's that's what caused his downfall. But they do talk about Saved by the Bell, and one of the big reasons why that show is so colorful. If you think about it, every time those characters are in the max, it is just total neon and all these different colors. The big reason is, is because it was a Saturday morning show that was also selling cereal and everything. And so while it was a bit of a gamble putting a live action TV show on the air on a Saturday morning, they made it so colorful so that it could kind of exist in the same mm -hmm. world with all of the cartoons. It does. That That's sense. interesting. I think I've seen something yeah. similar about Dustin Diamond, Saved by the Bell. Also, I'm making an assumption, maybe incorrectly, but the WWF at the time seems to also embody the mm -hmm. 1980s. Were you a fan of wrestling at all? Oh, are you kidding? Okay. Ultimate Warrior. That was, that, and you asked my son, that's his favorite too. Yeah, no, Ultimate Warrior was the WWE. You know, it's funny because, I, and I've said it before, and I think most wrestling fans would agree, the WWE, while it is a huge entertainment business, it's not as fun today as it was in the 1980s. I mean, there, there's nothing more you can say. Those guys might as well have been superheroes. I mean, so I come from a family of three girls, but some of these names that I'm going to reference from this time, I remember watching it with my grandpa and they called it like wrestling. And mm -hmm. it was the WWF at the time. Um, and I sort of remember people thinking that it was real. Mm -hmm. I guess the curtain hadn't been pulled back that it's scripted more or less. So apparently there was a publication, maybe it still exists, but Pro Wrestling Illustrated. I don't know if that still exists, but in 1989 it did. And they listed a few things. One is the wrestler of the year for 1989, Ric Flair. Most, most popular sense. Hulk Hogan, most hated Randy Savage. Now I seem to remember those two okay, teaming up at some point, Hulk and Randy, were they like on a tag team together at some point? It, it depends okay. on the year to be honest. Okay. I think even nowadays, if you look at WWE now in 2023, the heels, if you were, if you are, were also the heroes a couple years ago. I mean, they all go back and forth. It's basically a, a great big soap, Okay, soap that makes opera. sense. Feud of the year yeah. for 89 was Ric Flair versus Terry Funk and most improved Lex Luger. These names all sound very familiar to me. So it's a nice little blast from the past. Well, and Ric Flair's daughter is wrestling now and is oh. quite good. I know, no, Charlotte Flair, and she's quite good. I took my son to a, an event a couple months back, actually, and she was one of the headliners. It nice. was pretty cool. Well, it's, that's uh, a that's fun. Wrestling. Who'd have thunk it? Um, yeah. A few other things. So the top 10 billboards from this particular week that the movie was released just before Christmas in December of 89. You know, I got to say, a lot of these I don't really remember. The number one song was Another Day in Paradise by Phil Collins. Okay. Don't All Know right. Much, Linda Ronstadt is number two. Three, We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel, which I do remember. And then four <laughs> is Rhythm Nation by Janet Jackson. Good one. That's a, that's a good one. Five is With Every Beat of My Heart by Taylor Dane. Six, Back to Life, Soul to Soul. Seven, Pump Up the Jam by Technotronic featuring Felly. Do you remember this like Technotronic era in the late 80s? Yeah, de definitely. I mean, I don't know if, what was, what was the group? The C&C yep, music? Yes, Do you remember that? Yes, and even, <laughs> you know? I don't know if it would push it. Or yep. was that salt and pepper? Anyway, there were some good ones in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Phil Collins, though, is interesting. That's, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, but I'm, I, and at the same time, I would not have picked a Phil Collins song as being number one in 89. Well, but it's hey, week over cool. week. So I'm sure the week before, the week after, these shift a lot. This is literally a snapshot in time from the actual week that Tango and Cash was released. So like, oh, the, you know, because like, the number eight billboard song at that time was just like Jesse James by Cher. Good one. The New Kids on the Block. This one's for the children. Kind of forgot about New Kids somehow. Were you into New Kids at all? 
not no. <laughs> no, no. You know, to be honest, I wasn't. It was no. such a phenomenon, and I was. I don't quite. I don't know if I didn't quite get it. Like I, I wasn't in love with them like a lot of people were. Well, it's so wild that we look upon that now as being a joke when flash forward 10, maybe maybe eight years later, um, we had Backstreet Boys and NSYNC who were doing the exact same thing. You know what I mean? But, but what's so funny is by the time NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and all those boy bands came out, New Kids on the Block were kind of like yesterday's news. It was, who are these guys? You know, and they were they were a joke, but it's like... They, you know, if it wasn't for the new kids, then we wouldn't even have it's these other true. Two, It's these true. It's true. You know yeah. I mean, I mean so, and there were a few others yeah. earlier, but new kids, they were everywhere. I mean, the dolls, the bedding, and I actually did see them in concert as an adult. A friend of mine in California wanted to see them when we were in our 20s. So I saw them in concert. Um, and then Bon Jovi yeah. has had the number 10 song that week with Livin' in Sin. So... Yeah. Oh, Dare I ask okay. you to mention a few groups or songs that you can recall that you played all the time or taped from the radio? Oh, man, from 1989. Mm -hmm. No, sadly, I don't remember. I mean, I remember MC Hammer. Oh, yeah. But, the, but the, no, MC Hammer was 90, yeah, wasn't just, it? Yeah, just, I was, think so. Yeah. so. You got me at this, yeah, you got me at this just spot before. where I just... No worries. I can I, I know, yeah, well... Yeah. I remember, I do remember my parents had the record to the music from Rocky. <gasps> And I do, yeah, and it was like all the songs, and I do remember asking them to play that record well, quite a bit. Your parents so, raised yeah. you well, Sean. If they played a yeah, Rocky soundtrack yeah, so. for you. <laughs> oh, okay, so there's one more category here of news and events that happened during that time. The Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and U.S. President George H.W. Bush declare the Cold War over. I guess I always thought that Rocky did that in Rocky IV, though. <laughs> Am I wrong about that? No, yeah. You, 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 we, 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 I think we were lied to by one or the other. Yeah. yeah so. Also, I didn't re you don't hear much about Canadian mass murder, but the worst, apparently, the worst Canadian mass murder had happened at that time. Mark Lapine kills 14 women at U Montreal. The U.S. troops invade Panama and oust Manuel Noriega, but they don't catch him. And then there was an insane cold wave in the center of the US, most notably a negative 60 Fahrenheit in the Black Hills, South Dakota. And for the rest of the world that's not in the United States that uses the proper system of measuring the temperature, that is a negative 51.1 Celsius. That seems really cold. I don't remember, that's, that's shocking. Yeah. Yeah, wow. That I mean, I, I don't know one more to say, but you definitely pulled up some current events that are from completely different ends of the aisle and there. True. So. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I just have a few last questions before we jump into the movie. I do know that you are a big mm -hmm. fan of Kurt Russell. Please tell me more. Yeah, oh man. Yeah, oh boy. Your kid. Oh, goodness. Kurt. Easily since I was a kid. You know, what's interesting is he... Kurt Russell, I think I was saying this to you earlier, Kurt Russell is one of those guys who has this swagger about him. And not many actors have this, I would say. But he has always had this ability where he is just cool. You know what I mean? Where he is cool and you want to be him, you want to hang out with him. I remember, I mean, I don't know if you're a Seinfeld yeah. fan or not, but there was the there was the hilarious episode of Seinfeld where Elaine was dating Tony who was, what was that actor's name who played Tony? I'm drawing a blank. And anyway, Tony was super cool. And George was just infatuated by him. He was just thought he was so cool. And that's really how I feel about Kurt Russell. Keanu Reeves is another one. There's just, um, you know, when he walks in the room and when he's on screen, you just, he, he's cool. He just has magnetism about him. Kurt Russell, I will say, compared to Keanu Reeves, though, Kurt Russell is a better actor. Oh, yeah. Okay? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the... The guy's been acting since the late mm -hmm. 60s or whatever in Disney movies. And then when he transitioned into the 70s, adult movies, like, you know, ad uh, there were adult films. Uh, that not not you know, like X-rated, but just like for the adult audience. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Once he, he did Escape mm -hmm. from New York, and I think that mm -hmm. was a game changer for him. And like I said, there's, I mean, first of all, the hair. Can we just say his hair? Okay, I think any dude in the world right now who is listening right now who claims that they did not want Kurt Russell's hair in the 80s is lying. That is completely 
it just false, nope. okay? <laughs> because his hair was amazing in the 80s, you know? It was, a, what would you call it? It was like a mullet, but it just looked so I was so going to cool. ask you if you would have classified it as a mullet. It's technically, I think, is, but I hate mullets. But I'm like, yeah, I do like, I, no. I, I dig me some Kurt Russell hair. He pulls yeah. it off. Yeah, and you know what's so great about Kurt Russell is, I mean, he's one of the few actors, to be perfectly honest, who has been able to transcend and do multiple genres. And I honestly think anybody who wants to be able to see what Kurt Russell could do, I think the three movies you need to look at are Big Trouble in Little China, Overboard, and the one I'm talking about today, Tango and Cash, because he could be an action hero. His comedic chops are stellar they're impeccable he knows how to be funny and he's a romantic lead not many actors can juggle those different genres in those arenas as well as he does but the guy is just he's a badass i mean here i am i'm, I'm i feel like i'm swooning and i'm gushing over the guy but i mean he really is just so cool and what's also amazing about him i honestly feel the older he gets not many actors have this ability either but I honestly feel the older Kurt Russell gets, the better okay. he gets. He still just has that swagger. He is awesome in the Hateful Eight. I remember when the Denver Broncos played the Seattle Seahawks, oh, yeah. the, the pregame kind of like thing. Like for the Super Bowl, right? Them up or whatever. Mm -hmm. For the Super Bowl, yeah. And I mean, and his voice, oh. we haven't said that either. His hair is great, but his voice is just amazing. He's always had just this electric magnetism about him and i don't think there's any other actor out there who when he gets angry and he yells still just looks so cool i can't say enough about kurt russell but i think that's half the reason why i love this movie he does exude do. cool and he's got those piercing oh eyes yeah. too he's got really beautiful blue really like electric blue almost eyes or yeah so yeah he's mm -hmm. he does have the total package this, this kurt russell <laughs> uh <laughs> and when he goes when he leaves which i mean i hate and it's not going to be anytime soon but he also comes from a class of actor that we just don't get anymore because he is old now let's be honest and that's why we don't see him as much anymore because i think he likes hanging out on the golf course and if there's a script that comes his way that he feels is worth his time then he will he will, you know, saddle up and do it. But for the most part, I think he's content being retired. But what's cool is if you see him on talk shows, he's he's that rare breed of actor who speaks his mind and says whatever is on his mind, even if it's not maybe the most politically correct, okay. if you will. You know what I mean? And that's, I don't know, sometimes I feel like in this day and age, it's kind of interesting to see an actor who has the balls to... To, to do those things, to say those things. I should probably say, he has not said anything disparaging or anything like that by any means. You don't get actors nowadays that carry that kind of mm, moxie, yeah, that's is what true. I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you caught it or not, but listeners, I did do a bit in my season one trailer for the Retro Maid show about all the names that I had come up with for these stars that I am using for season one, Kurt and Patrick about how they resemble each other. Do you think that Kurt Russell and mm -hmm. Patrick Swayze look alike? Well, you know what's interesting? I'm sure you were going to be getting to it, but originally it was going to be Patrick Swayze in the yes. role of Ray Tango. No, no, excuse Cash. me, Cash. Gabe Not Cash. Ray Tango, yep. Cash, sorry. Yeah. yeah, it was going to be Patrick Swayze, but he opted to do Roadhouse instead, so they went to Kurt Russell. You know what's interesting is the similarities in terms of appearance is, I mean, it's definitely there. But I'm just like, well... I don't know if I could see Patrick Swayze in many of the roles that Kurt Russell did. Same thing with Kurt Russell. I don't know if I could see him mm -hmm. in many of the roles that Patrick Swayze did. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Point Break. Patrick Swayze owned that. I don't think I could see Kurt in that role. They have you know a very I mean? different presence. And yeah, like their types yeah. of roles they do seem to be a little different. They do both kind of bring an everyman quality and they're both very attractive. I just think that they physically have a strong resemblance to each other. And and I mean, kind of like what I said about Kurt Russell earlier, Patrick Swayze has also been able to straddle that line where he's done a couple yep. action movies. He's been a romantic lead. I don't think Patrick Swayze did a heck of a lot of comedies, did he? No, I mean, he did so, have a few. Yeah. And unfortunately, he left us far too soon. He has said that he was always very careful about the roles that he took because he didn't want to get pigeonholed into any 
specific genre. But he has done a few comedies. Fatherhood, Tu Wong Fu. Oh, yeah. Um, but Fatherhood came, I mean, that came. What's interesting is the 90s was a clear transitional period for all yeah. of these action guys. But I remember Fatherhood came, that mm-hmm. one came and went. I mean, it wasn't no, even in theaters no, long enough it wasn't for... A- even critics to see it. It was kind of sad. He, you know, Patrick Swayze, unfortunately passed away, but he, he, God, goodness, he had a double whammy of films because he would do Roadhouse, then he did Ghost, and then he kind of struggled with a lot of films in the 90s, kind of he finding did. his. Mm-hmm. He talks yeah, about it in his book. Yeah. I don't know if you Obviously, read his but, book or yeah. not. It's great. I own it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, at any rate, do you have a favorite Patrick Swayze yeah. movie or role? Um, <clears throat> Well, Point Break is the easy one. That okay. one comes to r- right away because that one is just that one is just amazing for so many reasons. I really liked in the Outsiders. He did an adaptation yeah. of the Outsiders, the S.C. Yeah. Hinton book. Um, I'm a fan of that book. Obviously, he had a wonderful role in that film. It's kind of become a little forgotten film, but he had a bit role in a film with Rob Lowe called um, Young Blood. Uh, it's uh, it's so these are all movies but, that we'll be yeah. getting to in this season of Retromade, but. A lot of people haven't seen that. It's yeah. so, I recall it being so fun. I loved it. Yeah, I remember seeing it as a kid and thinking it was pretty mm-hmm. cool, but I haven't gone back to it. But I remember he was cool. I mean, he was one of those actors who, when he when he took on a side role, a supporting role, he was still able to bring the thunder. And But if I had to pick which actor I always preferred over the other, I think I'd go to Kurt Russell just because I've seen more of his movies. I own more of his movies. He was always more up my wheelhouse. I mean, like I said, I feel like I'm man crushing on this dude pretty hard. I think every guy in the world, I mean, obviously, if you grew up in the 80s and the 90s, okay, there was Arnold, there was Stallone, there was Dolph, there was Van Damme, of course. But Kurt Russell was that one that, you know, I think every dude wanted to be. Agreed. You know I, I mean? Yeah, I don't think you're alone. The man crush of Kurt Russell. Yeah. It's, it's a legit thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the <laughs> hair. The hair. It's so cool. It was good. And we get a lot, we get a nice taste of it in Tango and Cash. So, so let's get into it. Yeah. Okay. So as we've discussed, Tango and Cash was released just before Christmas, December 22nd, 1989. It was rated R, which I don't recall it being rated R. Mm -hmm. We'll get into some of the cast and what people thought of it, but it was a little bit troubled in the directing department. I'm going to butcher the original director's name, Andrei Konchalovsky. He's a Russian Mm -hmm. filmmaker, which you wouldn't probably know him for a whole lot. Maybe Runaway Train from 1985, but that's about it. Anyway, he was later replaced. He was given impossible scheduling demands and was made the scapegoat when he fell behind. And also he had a much darker vision for this film than what we got apparently. So he was replaced with Albert Magnoli, but Albert Magnoli wasn't actually credited in the film credits of the movie, even though he ended it, he filmed all the chase and fight scenes. So additionally, according to Konchalovsky, Stallone was the one who held the production together, despite the fact that Stallone was also actively involved in trying to get him fired. Um, He since stated that he believes that Mm -hmm. if it weren't for Stallone, he would have been fired sooner. And big shocker, I think anyone who is familiar with Stallone from this era won't be surprised to hear that by the end of principal photography, Stallone was reportedly working in an unofficial capacity as producer, director, writer, as well as starring in the film. What do you think about that? Is that surprising at all? No. So here's the problem. Here's the big issue for why Tango and Cash kind of became the mess behind the scenes that it was, and it all falls on one person, Mm. it's Sylvester Stallone. I mean, let's be honest. I love Sylvester Stallone. Now, to give him credit, the guy has been in the movie business for almost 50 years, okay? He was the embodiment, he was one of the biggest stars in the world in the 1980s. So this is a guy, he knows what works. I mean, for him, you know what I mean? He knows Mm. how to light himself, he knows how to do. So I don't wanna mitigate that or discredit that. I mean, because he is a talent, okay? Having said all that, if you look at Stallone in the 1980s, in his prime, at the peak of his powers, it's gone on the record, okay, I'm not saying things hasn't been stated already, but he had an ego that was bigger than Mount Everest. And I think everybody would agree, and everybody has said this, that when Stallone was on set, he was the one 
controlling everything. He was mm-hmm. the one calling all the shots. He might as well have been the director. Yeah. And so if you look at a lot of his films in his prime, he was the director of a lot of them, but the ones that he did not direct. So here's what's interesting. If you look at look at this film, Tango and Cash, look at Demolition Man, and look at The Specialist. Okay. All of those films are fun on their own on their own. I enjoy those films. But if you look at them, they're all directed by no names. They're all directed by relative nobodies. And the big reason for that, I honestly think, is because they needed someone who was gonna essentially be pushed around by Stallone and not bitch about it. They're not gonna bring in a Spielberg or or a mm-hmm. Walter Hill or anybody like that. They're just simply not gonna take that. And so that's basically, I think, what happened on this film is you have Stallone in his prime of his powers pretty much running the show. And again, the guy knows what works for him. But on the other hand, like, if you look at stories on what he did with Cobra, behind the scenes of Cobra, he basically directed that one. You know what I mean? And he did that with, I'd say, about 98% of all the films Mm -hmm. he did in the 90s. Interestingly, it seems like his ego kind of got a bit in check back in the 90s because he later worked with Rennie Harlan and then later on down the line he worked with Walter Hill for Bullet to the Head. But the 80s, Stallone, he was not, um, he didn't sound like he was fun to work with. Well, he, <laughs> yes. Least. Now, I of course have to come to his rescue a little bit because I'm, Stallone is, I could just gush forever. I mean, I'm on a podcast about him. I love him for so many reasons. But he even admits, so he really was literally at the top of the world at this time and has admitted that his ego got out of hand. And so this doesn't surprise me. I think we've all heard the stories that he takes over filming. However, I will say the one thing that people do say, ego aside, is that he does have a very strong work ethic. Yeah, Mm -hmm. there was some problems on this film, to put it lightly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I was so looking forward to chatting about this film, because I can honestly, I will just say right now about this film, you can tell, I mean, you can see that this film had too many cooks in the kitchen. There is a, in my opinion, at least, there is a clear point in this film where it goes off the rails. And you can tell that the script was changed and the script was altered. So I'm really looking forward to getting that with you, because I will just say right now, I think this movie has a rock-solid, awesome opening 35 minutes. I think the first 30 to 35, 40 minutes or so of this film are awesome. It is amazing. But there is a clear point that I can pinpoint where it goes off the rails. I mean, it's not a great movie in the first 35 minutes. It's not like it's going to win Oscars or anything like that. But it just becomes... it. It devolves and gets stupider along the way. And I think that's one of the things that in the end kind of hurts it. But having said that, though, the first 40 minutes of this film are stellar. They are perfection. I wish the final 45 minutes were on par with the opening. That's you know an I'm interesting saying? take. I think I see where you're coming from. I I think that it's problematic from the start, but it's <laughs> fun. Listen, it's super fun. And you kind of have to... It's also interesting when we rewatch... Do you watch this often, or when was the last time you saw... I introduced it to my wife a couple years ago, because I've always been a huge fan of cop movies. I I love cop movies, Mm -hmm. especially buddy cop movies. So, Sylvester Stallone, Kurt Russell, doing a buddy cop movie? I mean, I'm going to be there for that. I didn't catch this one in theaters, because I was was Mm -hmm. seven years old. However, I do distinctly remember seeing ads for it in the back of comic books that I picked up as a kid, and I later rented it a couple years later, and then I remember buying the VHS, and then buying the DVD. The movie is a ton of fun, but the thing I will say about it is while we're kind of talking about Stallone and how his ego kind of helped um, uh, derail this film in some respects, I will say he and Kurt Russell have an amazing chemistry together. Their chemistry and their banter back and forth, I think is hilarious. Unfortunately, we never got a sequel. And I think a lot of that is because of Kurt Russell. I just don't think he wants to do it. But you know that if he said, okay, let's do it, Stallone would be there for in a sure. heartbeat. So, so one of my yeah. trivia, we'll jump around a little bit, which is fine, was that Kurt Russell was actually offered in 2010 when Stallone was getting all the action guys of yonder <laughs> together for the Expendables movie. He actually offered the role of Church, or maybe that mm-hmm. was a sequel, but he offered Kurt Russell a role in the Expendables and he turned it down. Turned it down. He just said he didn't have any interest in joining that ensemble action guy cast. 
So, um, yeah. But then what's so frustrating about that, but then Kurt Russell joins the Fast oh, and the Furious. Did he? I, which I have, I haven't seen those like, after yeah. like the second one. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of frustrating. I don't really understand that, but I will say this might put things in perspective, but did you know that Tango and Cash is actually the very last action film released in 1989? Yes. In fact, it was one of the last films yeah at all tango and cash and then there was a spielberg film yeah the last movies of the decade and it's almost kind of i mean you look about it now kind of makes sense but it's almost very emblematic of what happened to the genre and how things were changing and how stallone started to kind of Mm -hmm. fall on hard times with the film roles that he was choosing post Mm -hmm. this one but you know what i'm gonna say it going back to the film this film it's interesting you said that you had some problems with the opening i love it though oh i, I just mean like i, just I knew think, i just think the me, opening, what i meant by that is yeah you can immediately see what you're in for and it's you know oh yes yeah there were some problems immediately but i took it all in stride i mean i played that opening scene where stallone pokes fun at himself being rambo-esque and rambo's a pussy what did you think of that opening yeah well not only that but the even before that, Stallone says, let's do it. And then it goes into the film. I forgot about it's that, like, yeah. And you know, you you know, that was all Stallone. In the editing room, you know that he was saying, not only do I get top build, but I'm going mm-hmm. to open the film, okay? Before it's Tango and Cat, before we see Kurt Russell, I'm going to be first. And I want to get the first line of the movie with let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, You know, the the one that we have to say with this film, the score by Harold Faltemeyer is Aces as well. I absolutely love the score that was composed for this film. I think it's it sets the tone perfectly. I'm glad that you brought that up. I did not take note of the score. So I'm very glad that you brought that up because I that I missed that. But so speaking of let's like sets a stage here. As you mentioned, Stallone has top billing as Tango, Kurt Russell as Cash. Then we get Terry Hatcher as Tango's sister, Catherine slash Kiki, Jack Palance as Eve Perrette, and James Hong as Quan. Now, James Hong is literally the ultimate that guy. He's in everything, especially from this time. He seems to have been around forever. And we just discussed his performance as David Lopin in Big Trouble in Little China. So he was fun to see. So that's the cast. Then the description of the movie for, I don't know, anybody who hasn't seen this in a decade or two, perhaps. We have the polar opposites Ray Tango, a suave and sophisticated police officer, and Gabe Cash. His overzealous, long-haired partner are a mismatched LAPD crime-fighting duo who work tirelessly to bring down their arch nemesis, the ruthless drug lord Eve Perrette. However, when Perrette manages to incriminate the team with falsified evidence, Ray and Gabe will soon end up in a maximum security prison where an almost endless parade of inmates previously incarcerated by them are waiting for their captors impatiently. Now more than ever, Tango and Cash need to put their differences aside to quickly come up with a plan not only to escape the jail's walls, but also to even the score with the evil kingpin who put them behind bars once and for all. And of course, that's easier said than done. Did you know that this movie got some awards? Yes. I imagine probably Razzies. Actually, yeah, and, they didn't right? win, but they were nominated for three Razzies. Which I always think Agreed. those are unfair, but I imagine one of them is one of them is probably worst duo or well, something. Well, so the like Razzies that, right? historically don't like Stallone. Again, I know I'm a bit biased, but so yes, worst actor for Sylvester Stallone. I thought this was interesting. Worst supporting actress for Kurt Russell while he's dressed in drag. That's, I don't know. And then worse screenplay for Randy Feldman, who was the writer. So they didn't think that even the beginning was very good, but it it was a box office hit. It definitely exceeded its budget. And then some. And it's interesting that you read that premise because I had some thoughts that I'll be getting to on where the film kind of falls apart. But I honestly think that the film should be set 100% in the prison. And I feel like once they get out of the prison, that's where it falls apart. But we'll, I can see we'll that. get to that. I will say, you know, yeah. I'm like kind of backtracking a little bit. There were some scenes at the beginning that I liked, you know, just kind of showing them as polar opposites. So we get like Beverly Hills 
they even say a play on Beverly Hills Cop, but Stallone's highbrow Beverly Hills version with a three-piece suit. He has an office. Mm -hmm. And then contrasted with Kurt Russell's uber-casual common man version in downtown L.A., with jeans and his long hair. And he's just at a lowly desk in the precinct bullpen. And their incessant rivalry. I'm glad that you said that you liked their chemistry because I was going to ask you about that because I liked it. I thought it worked, but I can see how some viewers might see it as just a little bit too much, too redundant. The constant ribbing and joke, 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 trope, 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 trope. But for a buddy cop movie and these two, I do... I felt the chemistry, as you mentioned before, too. So I also liked it. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it does get a little tiresome a little bit. I mean, there's a few aspects about the film that I have to shake my head at. But one of the things that I just have to kind of roll my eyes at is no way would a police officer make the front page of a newspaper. I mean, these two cops, or I should probably say, we've seen police officers make the front page, but not for reasons like this. Yeah. But I've never seen police officers take the front page and be treated as heroes, if you will. It's just kind of funny. Ray Tango, he's, it's like everybody knows, like this is LA's top cop. And then Gabe Cash, well, he's also one of the top cops. And it's like one of these things, like, if you and I were opening up a paper, hey, did you hear what Ray Tango did today? Oh, well, Gabe Cash also got this cocaine bust. It's like, okay. <laughs> I never that's, heard that, that they're making newspaper headlines. That's a good this. point. And to play off of that theme, there were several things that I noted. Now, I know mm -hmm. when we watch these movies, we do have to suspend our disbelief and just kind of go with some of it. But were there any others? I... Mm -hmm. On a similar vein, I was like, they get 18 months for murder? I mean, I know that it was a plea deal, but 18 months. They were convicted of murder. I, I mean... Well, not only that... Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Not only that, but it's not just this movie. It's, it's, it's movies in general, I guess. But it just amazes me how quick the judicial yeah. system works mm -hmm. in movies. Okay? Cause, so if we were to go by this film's timeline, if you will, okay? You could go out tomorrow on Friday, commit a crime, and then by Tuesday, you would be in court on trial. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't work I, I was thinking fast, the same. Yeah, but according I know. to the film. <laughs> yes, it is the movie magic. Also, did this make you feel any type of way? I was like, okay, so Terry Hatcher, who plays Catherine, and then her, like, stripper name is Kiki or everybody calls her Kiki except her brother calls her Catherine yeah. at any rate Terry Hatcher's character plays Stallone's sister he is the super overprotective brother but somehow he has zero issues with her choice of career as an exotic dancer but, like what well not only that but I mean I can see why Stallone liked the character because I will say that the Again, I, I keep going back to this. The first 45 minutes of this film, I think, are really good, okay? But then it, again, falls apart. That's the last time I'm going to say that. But, for example, Ray Tango, I think Stallone picked some really cool little nuances and character touches to that character. The fact that he's, I think he's nicknamed Armani mm -hmm. with a badge, and he's like a stockbroker and everything. I mean, I think that is... A really cool touch. The glasses that he wears. I think he, he looks pretty cool in the, Listen, as he's walking those glasses. I, oh, he looked so but good then, that opening scene. Yeah. It, and did you know that yeah, those are actually scene, Stallone's glasses? Those are actually... Okay, well, I have another fact about the opening scene for you. But what's interesting is how they lose all of that after 45 minutes. He no longer is wearing the glasses. There's no more mention at all about him being a stockbroker or anything like that. It just gets thrown out the window. Fun fact regarding the opening scene, as amazing as the opening scene is, do you know that that is a shot-for-shot -shot remake of a Jackie Chan, of a scene from I a Jackie Chan movie? I did not know that. That's interesting. They just stole it. Police story. Police... They. I mean, well, Stallone is a huge okay. fan of Jackie Chan. And homage. so I think he was yeah. kind of paying okay. homage. Yeah. But I, I can send it to you on YouTube. But I mean, it is shot-for-shot. -shot. Same thing. He's standing in the middle of the road, has a revolver, the semi-truck halts on the brakes. Guys go out the windshield. I mean, it is exactly the same. Interesting. So, I anyway. did not know that. 
Um, I yeah. didn't catch that he was a stockbroker. I just thought that he was really into Maybe, it. Maybe, sorry. But he's very aware of, you know, so, yeah, no, you're right. I do feel like Stallone was probably, this is right before Rocky V. I feel like he, he's trying to distance himself, make, try not to be pigeonholed as this just like hunky, beefy, muscly guy, even though they, there's some jabs at that in mm-hmm. this movie. He was trying to be a little more sophisticated and show that he is smart, but that's a good point that you said he loses the glasses after a while, and it's true. Yeah, well, not only does he lose the glasses, but he loses every touch that made that character unique, with the exception of the sister. I'm just thinking about this. They could have done, okay, once they get out of prison and try to find bad guys who set them up, then where Stallone has to, or excuse me, Ray Tango, has to phone his mm-hmm. stockbroker to help him out and get him some information. Or maybe he has to phone his stockbroker to get him some money so that they can, you know... I mean, something like that, but they just throw that out. If I... Can I get to the point where I feel this film goes off the rails? Please do, yes. Is that okay? If you have... I'm... I'm, There's a specific moment. Okay. There is a specific moment. Okay. So, I, I will say, I think there is a fantastic nugget in this film. I think the idea of two top cops... Two badass cops who are at odds with one another, who are set up for a crime, are sent into a prison, and they survive amongst all of the criminals they put behind bars. And they have to figure out, they have to put aside their differences, team up to not only escape, but also fend off all these criminals that they locked up. I think that is an amazing idea. I think that is an aces idea. I think it's wonderful. And I think this film does an amazing job setting that up and when they get to prison some of the little prison antics are a little silly okay fine the prison escape sequence i Mm -hmm. think is kick-ass i love the prison escape sequence it's raining and they're using their belts to scale the telephone wires if you will so they can escape i love that scene it's awesome the problem is once they leave prison all stakes Mm. are out the window and in my opinion that is where i feel The script doctors, if it was Stallone, whoever it was, came in and started meddling with this stew. And the film really does, it really does kind of fall apart in some ways. Because if you think about it, once they're out of prison, they're still wanted fugitives. However, they're just wandering the streets. They're even, I mean, Gabe Cash is even. I know this is a movie, but he's even like calling in favors to guys on the precinct or whatever. And it's like, you know, you guys are still wanted, right? You know that not only were you imprisoned for this crime, but now you're wanted fugitives. And they're just, they're not disguising themselves in any way. Well, I guess uh, Cash does later on. It's right when he's dressed up as a woman. It just, and that's the other thing too. It's like, why, why is that scene in there? Why? Why is that scene in there? Suddenly at the end, you get this big giant truck that feels like it would be more suitable for some kind of Transformers movie. It's just, it just gets ridiculous. Well, you know? so they have the... <laughs> and it, it, for me, they, it falls yeah, apart. Yes, so there's all these favors. There are a lot of, yeah, probably like post-prison, a lot of characters introduced in quick sequence. It's like they know the mm-hmm. captain is on their side. They have people to help them. They have a gadget guy, which again, seems very action movie of 1980s that helps them with that monster it was like the batmobile within an rv with a computer system very high tech for 1989 Uh, (laughs) which is cool i mean don't get me wrong it's cool but i mean i don't know if that needed to be in the film there agreed there were a lot of things that i was like why do we keep introducing new characters yeah i i guess i can see your point there um i got a kick out of the nods or in jokes calling back to previous movies or just like in jokes, I guess. So there was the Rambo one at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then I feel like it was a shot at Arnold. Um, So everyone probably is aware of that in the eighties, there was a true rivalry between Sylvester Sloan and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So there's a scene in the prison when they first get to the prison, there's this Neanderthal looking dude and Stallone Mm -hmm. Ray Tango calls him Conan the Barbarian, calling back to an Arnold role, like poking fun at him. Did you think that's what was happening there? Like that he was making fun of Arnold? 
You know, I didn't put that together, but no, it makes total sense. I mean, it makes total sense because they they just did not like each other. There was that total rivalry. I mean, and then there are so many lines in this film that are there to float Stallone's ego, if mm-hmm. you will. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, um, there's there's the scene in the shower oh, or whatever. We're going to need to talk about the shower know. scene. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, but going back to what I said earlier, I mean, that, that's my big issue with this film that I've always struggled with this film is mm-hmm. I love it. Don't get me wrong. But once they escape prison, like I said, I feel that the stakes go out the window a bit. Mm-hmm. There aren't any core villains. I think Jack Palance is a cool villain, but I mean, you know that he won't be able to stand toe to toe against either Kurt Russell or Stallone. So there's really nothing. But again, if they had kept the film in the prison, then they could have squared off at Conan and they could have had some real some real menace there at, at some ways. But, you know, and I don't know. I, I'd like to see mm-hmm. the original script. I wonder if the original script was 100% in prison and then it got changed along the way. It sounds yes. like maybe well, it did. the original director had a much darker version. So I can, I, I that kind of aligns mm-hmm. with what you're saying. And there were far too many cooks in the kitchen. In fact... There there were technically four people directing this movie. So the original director, an interim person before they hired the other guy, and then unofficially Sylvester Stallone. So probably hard to coalesce around one solid idea. Yeah, the Jack Palance guy, it was almost weird. I didn't quite buy, talking about not buying, like why he, I mean, these cops keep busting his drug business, but I mean, that's just the way that it goes. It's not going to stop when these guys are out of the picture. And then there was this whole mouse maze backdrop too. He had the the the, mouse. Yeah. The mice. And then there was just a lot about the mice. And then at the end, that was kind of the only thing that I thought was like a little bit staked when there, there was all the monster trucks outside of that. I don't know if it was a warehouse or what, where there's a bomb inside and they're trying to escape the situation and they realize they're actually kind of in a maze. And so it's, it's all for Eve Perrette's amusement. But yeah, it was a little all over the place at, at that point. Well, you do kind of forget at a certain period because mm-hmm. he's off screen for so long, the Jack Palance yeah. in the movie. That's a big thing. I've that one of the things I've struggled with the film is you know he's the big villain who orchestrates this huge elaborate setup, if you will, and then he just kind of leaves the film. Which you know, he, Palance Jack Palance was on Jay Leno, and I mean, talk about old right. school actors who yep. speak their mind and don't give a damn. I mean, the, the, there was a hilarious interview on the Tonight Show where he's just like Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell, are the two biggest assholes around. I mean, he doesn't say that, but he's like, you know, they, they acted like bastards on set. They were completely... <laughs> and so so it is kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of sad when yeah. you hear that. You're like, oh man, like these guys are my heroes. But on the other hand, it's, you know... Also, you also got to think Jack Palance, he was the action hero of the 60s, 70s, okay. if you will. And suddenly now he's doing a film where the new action heroes are kind of taken over, there might have been a little bit of bitterness on his behalf, where he was kind of like, I'm the original Yeah, he brings up kind of like <laughs> the old Hollywood, hero. they wouldn't do this, because he did, yeah, basically that Kurt mm-hmm. and especially Sly were on a major ego trip. <laughs> it was an interesting interview, for sure. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing, yeah. I guess, to your point about things kind of falling apart is, there were too many bad guys i couldn't follow who like why were there so many bad guys there was james hong's character kwan who was hired there was him and then some other guy that they were hired by perrette but then there's also that ponytail guy with the british accent and then the jail Mm. all the jail people i don't know there was just a lot of bad guys and it was hard for me anyway to be like who's who why are they all involved um I honestly think if they had stripped this back a bit and just kept it in minimal locations, then, I mean, yeah, because as, as soon as, you know, Kurt Russell is um, is hiding and he's putting on the drag and everything, and suddenly you have this love subplot, if you will, between Gabe Cash and dating Ray Tangle's sister, you know, how dare he, you know what I mean? <sighs> It didn't need to be in there. And, and I have a buddy right now who, who's probably going to be listening and thinking like, no, I love the truck at the end. Okay, fine. They, I guess they could have kept mm-hmm. that in some way. But there are so many other little elements about this film that 
I don't belong in this particular film. Again, keep it in the prison. You know, they could have done so much. I like much that with idea. Prison. Yeah. You know what I mean? Having said that, though, I mean, I'm going to go back to what I said. The breakout sequence is awesome. I love the breakout sequence where they're teaming up and using their belts to go from tower to tower. I think that's a great sequence. Maybe save that for the yeah, end, though. I, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I remember seeing this for the first time. And after that prison escape sequence, the film really does kind of peter out. It really, like, it, it, it's, it's almost kind of, like, saved some of the best moments for that part there. And... You know, and then the film, it just kind of spins its wheels. Yeah, there's wheels. some filler with Rainer. the sister. Like, it serves yeah. no purpose, really, other than to show a pretty girl, you know? Yeah, and I still don't understand what her dance routine oh is. Oh, my it's God. Drumming, it was horrible. I, I actually yeah, read right. something that she yeah. learned how to drum for this role. And it was like, she just mm -hmm. hit a few, like, that, that's kind of sad, actually. But the escape scene, I took note of, I loved that it was raining, and they have their skimpy tank tops which segues into the shower scene we have to talk about the shower scene it was for me probably one of the <laughs> highlights of the movie because first of all we have a sylvester stallone and a kurt russell in their physical prime i mean they're so handsome so handsome and then with their ribbing each other just constantly and now they're in the shower we get a side by side naked shot of them walking away from us i mean but I will say, I, I'm not complaining, but that shower scene lasted forever. What did you think about that? I mean, it was, it's just kind of funny that there's a joke where Kurt Russell refers to Sylvester Stallone mm -hmm. as Pee-wee. And he says, don't flatter yourself, Pee-wee. And then later on in the film, he calls Stallone Tripod. I'm, so it's kind of like, what are we? And I honestly, I noted that too. I'm like, which is it? Because think, tripod is a major compliment. So, And I honestly think, I could be wrong with this, but I honestly think Stallone was in the editing room and he said mm, you know what i gotta end it with because if you notice mm -hmm. tripod comes it was later almost on immediately after but yes and it so, did come later yeah. or, or immediately after yeah and so i honestly think stallone was like no you have to end you can you can poke fun but it has to end where i am complimented you know what i no, mean and maybe that's... i'm wrong but i don't think i, I am you know <laughs> That very well could be, but I took note of that too. I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense. You're negating your insult, but I, I don't know, man, that shower scene was, mm -hmm. it went on kind of uncomfortably long. They just keep poking fun at each other over and over again. I mean, I enjoyed, it was very nice on the eyes for me to watch. So I shouldn't complain about that shower scene. And of course, I mean, it's the expected. Okay. You have a, a film in the late 80s with two action stars who are in prison you're gonna have that shower sequence you know what i mean now, i'm trying to think i think just about every movie set in a prison you're always going to get the obligatory shower moment i mean it's funny because i was watching um i actually think it's one of clint eastwood's best movies do you ever see escape from alcatraz oh it's been a very long time but yes there is a sequence in that film and clint eastwood oh. uses the opportunity in the shower to to beat the hell out mm. of a man you're you know right I mean? there is that is <laughs> so always kind of part of, of it i was like we're in for a treat when there's yeah. a side-by-side -side nude scene of them walking away from us i quite enjoyed that stallone does like to show his butt in movies so there's that. Not as much as Jean-Claude Van Damme. That was always, it seemed like it was in Jean-Claude Van Damme's <laughs> contract. Where he hey, I mean, to... if you got it, flaunt it, I guess. And I think Van Damme even said that later on is, I, I remember listening to, was it a commentary track or something? But he just said, like, I, I work hard on this, so I'm going to show it off. So, you know, hey, yeah. good, good for him. If you got it. Yeah, those guys, the amount yeah. of work that, yeah, that's sculpting of clay. Let's see. The I was just thinking that there was a few other pieces of trivia that I noted. Um, I was glad that you brought up that Swayze was originally supposed to play Kurt Russell's role. Um, did you see who some of the other people they considered were? I did not. I yeah, may have heard so, this, though. I mean, according to my internet research, they considered Pierce Brosnan, Kevin Costner, Liam Neeson, and Bruce Willis. But obviously, Kurt ultimately got the role. You know what? Obviously, I love Kurt Russell in the film, but you hear that list, and I could see any one of those actors also taking really? on the game cash. To, you know, I but I don't think they would have been able. See, again, this is the beauty of Kurt Russell is he is able to nail those comedic lines 
perfectly. And as much as I like Kevin Costner, um, I was going to say the only one I could see was maybe Bruce Willis from a comedy perspective. Yeah, yeah. he he can do comedy. Yeah, but I don't know about the other guys. I definitely couldn't see Liam Neeson doing it. Plus, around this time, he was he was doing like Next of Kin, oddly enough, with Patrick Swayze. So yeah, interesting casting. What ifs? Now, yeah. here's another, like, on the lines of casting. So Terry Hatcher was not the original actress that they had hired to play Ray Tango's sister. I forget her name. Either way, at this time, both of them were relatively unknown. But they ended up casting Terry Hatcher. This is a detail I appreciate because she looked more like Sylvester Stallone. They look like they could actually be related. Isn't that a fun little tidbit? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Which they kind of do. Like the dark features and everything. Yeah, that is interesting. I guess that's the only characteristic of Stallone's character that is from point A of the film to the end of the film is the fact that he has the little sister. But everything else about that character is thrown out. I will say about the movie that I've always loved is as much as we've dogged the the final act of the film, how silly it gets, I do love the fact that the film ends with a freeze frame of Tango and Cash what is it they're holding hands Mm -hmm. up in the air high-fiving and it just ends that's the other thing too this film does that not a lot of films do nowadays is it doesn't overstay its welcome to an extent after that final action sequence they high-five boom hit credits we don't need an epilogue of them putting aside their differences and get ready to suit up for the next mission no it it knows when to yeah it was that perfect happy ending that you don't really get a lot anymore mm-hmm. in movies. More quips. They're constantly, yeah. can I finally date your sister over my dead body? Okay. Don't you just admit it that you guys work well together? Oh, yeah. At least earn the right to date your sister. Over <laughs> my dead body. Deal. And when the way it ends, you wonder, okay, are they going to be joining the department? Or it seems like both their commanders give them long leashes on the department so maybe they would be starting up their own where they're given Mm -hmm. carte blanche to you know that that could the sequel we never it's true i i don't think it needed a sequel but it is surprising and that's the reason i brought up the expendables how kurt turned down the expendables only because so this was a box office hit so it's kind of surprising they didn't do a sequel and i wonder if there was a lot of trouble on the set i guess they were went way over budget The timeline took way too long. In fact, I was reading that the film just finished weeks before it was actually in cinema due to those delays and a few other like compounding factors. The final cut of the film was approved by the studio just days before it was supposed to be theatrically released. So I don't know if people didn't have a good time. you can tell. Like making it, perhaps. And you can tell. I mean, it does feel there are elements of this film that feel Frankenstein stitched together. very much so. You know what I mean? And can very much tell. It's kind of a shame that 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 release was so locked in that they couldn't have, you know, hey, you know what? Let's delay it six months or a year so that we can find more. Wanted to get um, out for Christmas, I guess. But yeah. It being a box office hit, I also saw, it was not a critic darling by any stretch of the imagination. I thought this was funny. The Los Angeles Times called it a waste of talent and energy on all levels. A bit harsh, or what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I think that's a bit harsh. I mean, because I think, you know, both Kurt Russell and Stallone, we already talked about Kurt Russell, but Stallone too. I mean, these guys are movie stars who have that swagger that just lights up a room. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't say it's a it's a waste of their talents. If you want to talk a waste of Stallone's talents, take a look at Escape Plan too. <laughs> You're right. I, I don't think that's fair. I think I don't think this film was ever going to be a critical darling because it is a big, dumb action movie with a huge emphasis <laughs> on dumb. It is absolutely just bananas in yeah. so many ways. But also, it's a lot of fun. You know what I mean? And And something else that we really haven't talked about that I think is important to note is... You know, sadly, I remember on my respective podcast, I remember speaking with Will Bell, who is, he was the writer for Aquaman. He's actually a former police officer himself turned oh, screenwriter. Cool. And he said that the, the cop movie, if you will, is fraught right now in Hollywood. So chances are we're really not going to be getting 
any other police themed movies in Hollywood. And if we do, let's be honest, it's it seems to typically where they are crooked, if you will, or there's a bad element, you know, which which is fine. I mean, you know, Training Day is an amazing movie. Dark Blue, also with Kurt Russell, is a great movie. But these movies where the where the police officers are just these kind of renegade mavericks who get the job done but at the same time are so cool. I don't want to sound completely nostalgic, but I, I think I can say with certainty, I don't think we're going like to get these ever party. again. Yeah. We're not getting a maverick, you know, the cop who plays by his own rules, but gets the job done. We're not going to see those. And again. that's part of the fun. And that's you like know? really kind of part of the show too. It is, it is nostalgia. It is, this movie is so a part of its uh, time that we don't get it. And that's why it's fun to reminisce about movies like this because we don't get it anymore. It's, the mm -hmm. landscape is so different now for a number of reasons that we won't get into to bore everyone to death. Yeah. I'm trying to think through some other little tidbits before we share our final thoughts, but it does pay if Stallone likes you because, oh, there was also two things. One, there was a scene where he says, I hate Danish. Somebody's like, let's, you know, I don't know if it was Gabe was like, let's stop and get Danish and coffee. It says Tang, mm -hmm. Tango a... says... I hate I Danish. He was just going through a bitter divorce with his Danish ex-wife, Brigitte Nielsen. So there was a lot of those in this movie yeah. that I thought were interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool to see an actor poke fun at themselves and their career. Yeah. But it's really interesting, though, that they were poking that much fun at, I guess, I, I say they, but Kurt Russell really isn't poking fun at his career. It's more oh, the Stallone sure. show, but the fact that he was doing that in yep. his prime. Yeah, you know I mean? and if he likes you, so obviously like Brigitte, they were married for a year and a half and she was in two of his movies. Anyway, the guy who plays Rakeen, I think is his name in the movie, but he's referred to by the guys, by Gabe and Ray as ponytail because he wears that slicked back low ponytail. Do you know what the guy I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah so apparently, yeah. and again, it's like, why was he there? Why was he in this movie so much? Well, it turns out his original role was a very small one. But he has a British Cockney accent that Sylvester Stallone loved. And so his role got expanded mm -hmm. because of that. So, piece of Yeah, no, trivia. that's... Uh, I was aware of that. I believe that actor's name is Byron. Goodness, I, oh, I've, I had... I've lost his name. It's Byron something. Yep. But he actually passed away okay. um, a few years ago. But he was a bit actor in a ton of a ton of stuff in roles like these like guy. where he was kind of that that henchman mm -hmm. if you will yeah he was in red scorpion with dolph lundgren he shows okay. up in that he was in a very underrated comedy that does not get the credit it it deserves he was in one with chris elliott called cabin boy oh, that was okay. quite funny so um, uh, byron allen is his name sorry byron brian. Oh, excuse me i'm sorry not byron brian brian james it's spelled b-r-i-o-n though like it's spelled different yeah, yeah. good call yeah. Yeah, Brian James. So yeah, he was one of those great mm -hmm. character actors that we lost that we don't see too much anymore. Indeed. So I will say the scene where he has the grenade strapped to his mouth is funny. It comes a little late and is a little too silly for the film, I will say. You I liked I mean? that scene It'll... too. He puts it in his pants and it's like, this is my uh -huh. contribution to birth control or something. Uh, I liked oh, that bit. Fun. So gosh, yeah. I know we've been a little bit all over the place with this movie because it in and of itself was a bit all over the place. But we get a nice, super perfect, cheesy 1980s ending. I mean, it seems like we could go on and on just forever, but we do have to return to the present day reality until next time. Do you have any closing thoughts about this movie before we talk about your work? I love it. I love it. Um, I wouldn't put... Well, you know what? Actually, no. I, I think I will put it in my top 10 of, of Stallone films. Really? Because it is Stallone okay. in his prime. Yeah. Because, I mean, again, it, it's Stallone in his prime. And I think when... And it's not just Stallone, but I think it's any actor, to be perfectly honest. Their most memorable pieces of work are when they're in, their, in that sweet spot, if you will, of their career. That prime period. You know what I mean? And so, um, you know, obviously there's the Rocky and there's the Rambo. Of course, is going to hold a special place. So I think this is, you know, it's big, it's dumb, it's goofy. It's um, a guy's guy action movie. But there's also something, there's some stuff in there for the ladies. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. Um, I, I think there are some problems with it. As we talked about ad nauseum. I'm sorry. Oh, if I no, no. That's about what those. we're here for. But I think it's, it's a lot of fun. What's cool about it, too, is it's one of those movies. It's a perfect background mm -hmm. movie. 
It's one of those movies that I can, you can put on in the background on the afternoon or a Friday night, whatever it may be, and you're still going to love it. I've come back to it multiple times for rewatches. It's a ton of fun mm-hmm. on rewatches. It does the trick. It's Yeah, I was there, curious yeah. how often you gave it yeah. a rewatch, so that's helpful to know. I, I'm a Stallone girl, so I don't know if I would put this in my top 10. I just looked to see what the IMDb rating was, and it's a 6.4 out of 10. And honestly... That's probably okay. where I would put it. I love it for what it is. Like, I'm not trying to say, you know, put today's standards on it or it was a fun, silly, buddy cop movie of its time. There were some problems, but it's fun. It's fun. It's action. And yes, for me, action isn't my big, it's not my favorite genre by by any stretch of the imagination, but you add some fun flavor with these two guys, I mean, Sylvester Sloan and Kurt Russell in their prime, you almost can't go wrong. It's going to be a good time. So I, I think people, if you haven't seen Tango and Cash for a while, put it on. Do some cleaning around the house. Make some dinner while you're doing it. And like Sean said, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to... Yeah, you're not going to miss any any vital plot elements in any kind of way. If anything, the worst thing that will happen is they'll say, "Now, who's this character? Where? You know, why?" But in in the end, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, if you're wondering why suddenly Michael Pollard is coming in trying to sell him the uh, the, yeah. the truck, there were a few other matter. guys that I was like, "Oh, I know him from this and that." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh wow! If you want to go full circle, the auditory expert who is the expert mm-hmm. in sound or whatever. That is Michael Jeter, who we were talking earlier about Evening Shade, but he was on Evening oh, Shade, so there you go. Way to bring it all the way around. Yeah. Nice job, Sean. Yeah, well, there you go. You know, yeah. I really can't thank you enough for joining me to reminisce about the last action movie of the 1980s. Please honor. tell us where people can find even more of your awesome stuff. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I host... Uh, my favorite action star is, is Mr. Dolph Lundgren. And so I host uh, I Must Break This Podcast, which is, of course, a, a reference to his one of his most iconic lines. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's a fun podcast. I've been doing it now for the past five, six years. Uh, me and a special guest look at his extensive filmography and break it down. In between a lot of those episodes, I've been very fortunate to speak with a lot of really cool people who have had a hand in making a lot of these films with uh, with Mr. Lundgren. So um, I've spoken with directors and screenwriters, stunt performers, actors, you name it. I'm um, still I'm holding out hope that maybe I'll be able to get Mr. Lundgren on the show one day. So, you know, never say never. The show is, fortunately, unfortunately, we're actually in, in the, the third act, I guess, of the show, if you will. We're coming upon his most recent work. And so the show is going to be wrapping up and kind of being put to bed we'll see because um you know we're, we're getting caught up to his most recent efforts you know we, we still have uh, some gas left in the tank i will say um but uh yeah it's been a ton of fun so please check it out it's on its own feed it's also on the last of the action heroes podcast it's great Network. i love Dolph. i'm so glad that your show exists sean and i'm sure you'll find something to keep you busy you know even after the final act of your Dolph show Hey, as, as, as I keep getting these guest appearance opportunities for this for shows like this, awesome. then we'll be okay. Awesome. So. And hey, everyone listening, if you like what you're hearing, why not follow Retromade on your podcast app and subscribe to the Retromade Podcast YouTube channel. Until next time, be kind. Rewind.